Jumping the difficulty up to give yourself more of a challenge can make you struggle a lot more than you're expecting. You also harvest less from plants, take worse wounds, and there are fewer animals on the map. That combines to make even mustering the same defense a lot harder, when you really need a whole lot more to survive. I'm going to go over two parts of that, building a better defense itself, and having a better economy to afford that superior stronghold. The first part of that is a complete setup. Being outnumbered early on means that you can't afford to take fair fights. I'm not talking about abusing the AI using unpassable moats or walling them off, which I avoid doing because it's just not that fun for me. I'm referring to making sure that your villagers are always doing more damage to them than they are to you. That includes the basics first and foremost. Your archers need to be on high ground. It gives them about 50% more damage and increases their range, while also reducing the damage they take. That almost immediately means one of your archers performs as well as two of theirs assuming equal gear and stats. One level through four levels up all confer the same bonus, so high ground on your wall is just as good as those huge towers you see in other people's screenshots. Don't build any higher than that or they will suffer a penalty to their range. Once you're on that high ground, make sure you put a row of merlons in between your archers and any approaches to give your villagers cover. Cover reduces how frequently incoming shots hit and merlons provide the highest amount by blocking over half of all hits. A shot blocked by cover will give you that orange shield symbol and when an enemy crit is doing more than a third of your villagers health, you're going to be glad to see it popping up over and over. Along that vein, you want to make sure that there's no cover between you and your target. Trees, bushes, and natural dirt walls can all give enemies cover, and you don't want to make the fight any more fair than it has to be. Between high ground and cover, your archers are about four times as powerful as equally strong raiders, although it's definitely not going to feel like that when they outgear you early on. When designing your archer's nest, make sure that there are clear lines of sight between them and your entrance so that they can hit melee raiders in the back without your walls giving them some kind of cover. And speaking of their melee raiders, you need to take even more care with your melee villagers. Make sure that they're someplace safe where they can't get surrounded or grouped up on. They need to be in a single file choke or encircled around a single entrance if you're rocking multiple melee fighters. That said, I'd really recommend limiting how many melee weapons you dole out early on. Your archers are mostly going to be rocking short bows unless they're not going to be dealing enough damage to thin enemies out or to quickly focus fire down their archers if you don't outnumber them. Your melee fighters also aren't going to have the armor to weather a lot of hits. For something sturdier than a single file choke, unlock smelting early on. That'll let you make iron bars and put in a grated door. Give a melee soldier a two-handed weapon and park them right behind the door. They'll attack through it, hitting enemies on the other side, while those enemies largely attack the door itself. Even if they do turn to hit your settler first and your settler starts to get a little bit low, you can have them retreat back to safety very easily. A reinforced door is great for this. It's going to buy a lot of time, although you are going to need to unlock defensive structures 1 for it. Being able to pull back like that is a huge help, and you want to provide that to more than just your melee soldiers. Your archers are going to need it. This is especially risky early on, when you won't have any armor or a helmet on everyone. An enemy archer's longbow crits for 35 damage even from the low ground, which means one shot can kill someone that's still conscious. A corner of walls do the trick for archers really well, and this also allows them to stay in the fight by shooting at melee raiders while the rest of your archers continue focus firing theirs down. I've mentioned it a couple times now, so what is focus fire? Your soldiers naturally choose targets in range, with a preference for those that are attacking them. However, since enemies randomly choose their targets, this means your villagers are often hitting different enemies if you just let them auto-target. Focus firing means telling all of your archers to hit the same target. This means that they'll die as quickly as possible, and you're not going to take any longer to kill the entire group, which means that you're in turn taking less damage. You can also do this in melee fights, although it is a little bit less important there. It's also a good idea to break up enemies' focus fire. If a few of their archers are all shooting one of your villagers, pull them back for a bit. Once they've been out of line of sight for a little while, enemy archers will choose new targets and they'll generally choose different ones. All of this talk about reinforced or graded doors assumes that your village is entirely walled off. It's a change of pace from easier modes where a simple tower will work, but you really need to be completely walled off by the first raid's arrival if you're pumping up the difficulty. That doesn't have to include a huge maze of traps or anything fancy, but there need to only be as many doors in as you can actually build proper defenses for. I'd recommend only going for one entrance early on, even though it is going to make trips out in the wrong direction a little bit slower. That's enough talking about setting up the actual front lines, so let's back up and go into how you actually manage all of that. I mentioned research that takes hundreds of blue books, enough wood to build large structures and weapons, and enough infrastructure to feed and keep all of your villagers happy. I threw it out like it's nothing, but getting all of that early enough to actually fend off the first raid takes an efficient workforce. You don't need to be min-maxing everyone or follow a theoretical perfect build for either your villagers or your village itself, but you should be trying to set them all up for success, and that starts the moment you load in. You can build out in the open and succeed, but you are going to find it a lot easier to start off close to hills or a ledge that act as walls. 
That'll mean that you can build less and secure more land with it. It'll also make it a lot easier to only have one entrance and place you need to defend. Try to put down some of your early buildings in a way that allows them to be part of your outer walls. You're also going to want to use diagonals to increase the area you have encompassed when possible. This outcrop at the bottom of my base almost doubles in area with a few extra pieces of wall along bottom and then connecting it via diagonals at the top. I could have grabbed even more area by instead doing the diagonal at the top of my base, but I wanted to use my kitchen for the actual full wall. It's not as straightforward as just positioning your buildings along the walls. You need to actually set your base up to run efficiently. It's a little bit easier said than done, but there are a couple simple tips you can follow. Keep production circles close. Put your crop fields near a small cellar and a kitchen, which should be near a table in the bedrooms themselves. Smelters should be kept close to an iron vein if there is one, or if there is not, keep it close to your entrance. Although this valley map had next to no iron on it, so it didn't really matter. Keep any blacksmithing workshops nearby to that. This is going to minimize how much time they spend running between tasks and hauling, which are the two biggest time killers that you can minimize. You'd be shocked just how much effective downtime your villagers have if you just throw things down without thinking about where they should go. That also means getting people working on what they're actually good at. When you can't, like when your early researcher doesn't yet have a research bench to actually work at, or before your smith has the technologies needed to put them to work, have these people prioritize hauling instead of helping with things that they're bad at, like chopping trees or building walls. It's better to have them do something they're bad at than stay idle, but they're going to do more for your village doing something that doesn't take any skill at all. Letting them do things that they're bad at also takes away experience from colonists that you'd rather have it on. And speaking of putting your researcher to work, make sure you put in an early table for them to work at. It's especially important early on on these harder difficulties. You can get about 200 blue books before the first season is done, even with a middling intellectual skill. That's enough for the full suite of early game economy technologies, like agriculture, furniture, preserving food, fermenting, and smelting, plus combat technologies, like defensive structures, wooden weapons, tailoring, and an armoring table. Even when early raids hit, as in the example village I made for this video, you should still have enough iron ingots to build good doors, enough bows to suit your needs, and basic infrastructure like crops all in, all while being able to build up proper defenses using wood or other resources around you. If you find yourself lacking on these fronts, it's probably a sign that your builder and or researcher aren't able to be efficient enough. I'd focus on making sure that they're always doing something productive first, before you start focusing on whether or not they're being as useful as they can be at any given point. If you want to see a deeper dive into planning an efficient base to fix that kind of thing, I made a video on the topic of production circles a while ago that you'll love. And if you want to see me ignore my own good advice for the aesthetics and for the story, you'll love my current playthrough. I use some of the tips I talk about here, but I also ignore some of them just for fun.